Well, it's my great pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Mary Ellen Rudin, who will address us on set theory and general topology. Mary Ellen. In case you didn't recognize him in the tie, that was Marvin Knopf. <laughs> By no stretch of the imagination could I be called a set theorist nor am I topo a topologist in the usual sense, for topologists usually deal with manifolds. They do differential structure on them, and uh, they look at their algebraic structure, and they <coughs> study their piecewise linear geometric structure. But I'm a general topologist, and I work with more pathological spaces. Um, properties like normality and metricity and paracompactness are seriously in doubt. Uh, when I look at a space usually, and uh, one tries to uh, prove that some properties are preserved by products or by special functions, <coughs> classification theorems are solved. Uh, frequently questions take the form, does there exist a space satisfying blank, 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 and so on. The um, Gods of general topology are Cantor and Kuratowski and Alexandrov and R.L. Moore. Um, it's a very shallow subject in a way, a very horizontal subject. Everything is very close to the top. Um, as soon as you know how to define a normal space, you can look for a normal space whose Cartesian product with an interval is not normal. Uh, and it's not guaranteed that you will be more efficient in finding one for 20 years' experience. Uh, it's uh, sometimes general topology looks like a, a vast, uncharted morass uh, that uh, is peopled mostly by hairy and hairier examples and only an occasional theorem. Theorems which tend to be either simple to prove or so complicated to state that you don't care whether they're true or not. <laughs> but um, there's an occasional just beautiful problem. A problem that is very simple to state and understand. A problem that uh, you keep running into again and again so that you get all kinds of equivalences for it. Problems that um, uh, you really have a strong feeling that you ought to be able to answer. Um, problems that except for equivalent formulations remain untouched year after year. And a few such problems have yielded to attack in the last five or six years, um, partly because people have recognized that the reason that they seem so uh, annoyingly basic <laughs> is that they are really set theory problems rather than topology problems. Even though they are couched in topological language and uh, topologically motivated, they are uh, rather basic set theoretic ideas. I want to discuss four such problems with you today. Um, perhaps before I discuss my four gems, I should say that things do go on in general topology that aren't these beautiful, nice little uh, uh, set theoretic problems. The prettiest theorem probably proved in the last three or four months was proved by um, a couple of young men who showed that if you take the hyperspace of the unit interval, that is, if you take an ordinary unit interval and take its uh, closed subsets and give it the Hausdorff topology, that this is the Hilbert cube. This was proved by West and, um, uh, let's see, who else? Uh, uh, Shorey was the other uh, man who did this. They have a very nice proof which depends on the use of geometric topology, piecewise linear topology, and the methods that have been developed by uh, um, the infinite dimensional topologists, which have yielded a whole series of beautiful theorems in the last five or six years. Um, very classical classification theorems are being done very well now. Ernie Michael has some beautiful ones 
that have been uh, published in the last four or five years, and Arkhangelsky has some beautiful ones, too. Um, there's another area in general topology that has a tremendous number of people working in it. This is compactifications. This is pure and unadulterated set theory, and um, the set theorists are also contributing to this subject. No one has gotten even close to the basic problems, I think, in this area, but I think the next 10 years we'll see some people getting close to the, <laughs> to the hard problems in this area. And it is an area where what the four problems will be. I will attach men's names to them. Suslin's problem, Moore's problem, Alexandrov's problem, and um, Balfour's problem. All four of them are questions of the form, does there exist a Suslin space, does there exist a um, normal Moore space that's not metric, and so on. And the answer to this one is both yes and no are consistent with the axioms of set. The answer to this one is both yes and no are consistent with the axioms of set theory for separable ones. The answer to this one is no. The answer to this one is yes. So that uh, they <laughs> come out in uh, slightly different ways, but they're in a way related problems and I want to discuss them together. Suslin was a young, young Russian of 25 when he died shortly before the publication of the first volume of Fundamenta in 1920 in which his problem was stated. The problem said, suppose you have a non-degenerate connected linearly ordered space with no first or last points. That sounds like you've got a line, right? Um, and suppose that every collection of disjoint non-empty open sets is countable. This property is called the countable chain condition, usually. Um, under those two circumstances, he conjectured that the space would have to be a line. He knew that if the space was separable, it would be a line. So the question is, does there exist a space with these two properties which is not separable? Now, if you, uh, I guess it was known essentially from the beginning that uh, Suslin's problem was a set theory problem. Because uh, suppose you had such a space. If you have such a space, um, you can take some countable collection of points out of it together with their closures and what will be left? Well, there has to be something left. Why? Because the space is not separable. Uh, what has to be left from A is a collection of intervals. And from B, the collection of intervals has to be countable. All right, now then, uh, remove a countable number of points from each of these. And what's left? Well, there has to be something left. And what's left has to be a countable collection of intervals. In this way, you build a tree. For each countable ordinal, you've removed a countable collection of points. All right, take the union of all those countable collections of points together with their closures. And what's left has to be a collection of a non-empty collection of intervals, and uh, this collection of intervals is partially ordered by inclusion. So the problem has an immediate translation. Does there exist a tree? Now, a tree is a partially ordered set in which every chain, every totally ordered subset is well-ordered, which has uh, uncountable many members in the tree, but every chain in the tree, every totally ordered set in the tree is countable, and every anti-chain is countable. And it's obvious that you can ask this question for any cardinal. Suppose you have a cardinal, K. 
Does there exist a tree of cardinality k in which every chain has cardinality less than k and every antichain has cardinality less than k? Now then, uh, to give you a little flavor for the thing, what about uh, using just countable trees? What about infinite countable trees? Cardinality LF1. Uh, if you try to make a tree with each level finite, what do you have to have in the end? A chain running through. So what's the question? What's the answer to the question, does there exist a Suslin tree of cardinality LF0? The answer for LF0 is, uh, <laughs> I nearly said the wrong one. No, there doesn't exist a Suslin tree for LF0. On the other hand, if you ask the question for LF omega, um, <coughs> take the first infinite ordinal and stretch it out there. I mean, you know, put them all in. Then take the next infinite ordinal and the next infinite ordinal and the next infinite ordinal. This makes a tree, this fan, makes a nice tree of cardinality LF omega. Every antichain in it is countable. Every chain in it has cardinality strictly less than the cardinality of the tree. So the answer for this is yes. But for LF1, which is this one, and LF2 and LF3, and for most of the ones you think about usually, the answer is, I don't know. There's no reason to think there should be, and there's no reason to think there shouldn't be. Well, a young, uh, not young, Stan Tannenbaum, a logician, um, was absolutely fanatic in his determination that the methods of Paul Cohen should show that the statement that I just made is a fact. That is, that it is consistent with the axioms of set theory that they're B. Suslin trees and that they're not B. Suslin trees. And uh, after several tries, he and Solovey and B. Jack and quite a few others uh, essentially showed you can have anything you want. You can have a Suslin tree and the uh, continuum hypothesis. You can have, uh, have a model set theory in which you have the, a Suslin tree and the continuum hypothesis holding. You can have a model of set theory in which you have a Suslin tree and have the continuum hypothesis not holding. You can have a model of set theory in which you have a Suslin, uh, you don't have a Suslin line and do have the continuum hypothesis. You can have a model of set theory in which you uh, um, do not have a Suslin line and I don't remember where I was, but that's, <laughs> you get the idea. And you can have them for different cardinals and you can have them be homogeneous if you want, or you can have them be, they have there exist a, a model of set theory in which there is a Suslin line, but it's not homogeneous. Um, but there are, and that there are, that they don't exist in any, in any homogeneous ones in your model. Um, what once no one could do, now everybody could do. And the methods seem applicable to answer almost any related question you may wish to ask. So these uh, questions are uh, <laughs> under very realistic attack. The general topologist's contribution to this solution to this problem was zero, except for asking the question in the first place and being interested in the answer. <laughs> uh, the next problem, I want to discuss is Moore's. Um, the question is, does there exist a normal Moore space which is not metric? It's a problem that has haunted graduates of the University of Texas and their students and their students' students and their students' students uh, for uh, 35 or 40 years. Uh, Moore devised a set of axioms for the plane. And 
he and his students had worked with these for quite a number of years before the publication of his uh, colloquium volume in 1932 on the subject. And the most interesting part about these axioms was the first three parts of the first axiom. These first three parts became known, a space satisfying those, became known as a Moore space, uh, guaranteed that your space was Hausdorff and that it was regular and it had what Bing calls a development uh, in his effort to try to popularize the notion. The uh, <laughs> thing that the development guarantees you is a collection of covers, G1, G2, G2, 3, and so on, by open sets, such that if you take any point in the space and take its star with respect to G1 and its star with respect to G2 and so on, this forms a basis for the topology of your point. This is sort of an approximation for a metric. Uh, despite thousands of papers on the subject, the subject has, the um, idea has never become popularized. It, uh, if you want to prove a theorem about a metric space, it's often true for more space, but it's infinitely harder to prove. Um, and if you want an approximately metric space, you usually want normality. And if you assume normality, you, for all you know, the space is metric, so you might as well assume metric and be done with it. So it isn't a very popular idea, except that this problem has persisted. Now, um, the background for attack on the problem was basically laid by Bing and Jones and Heath. Jones, in 1937, proved that if 2 to the LF naught is less than 2 to the LF1, then every separable normal Moore space is metric. This follows immediately from the continuum hypothesis, so you uh, have uh, a good theorem there. Um, Bing, in 1951, show that if there was a space which was not metric, that the space had to fail to be collection-wise normal. I won't even define it, but it's a, uh, something that gives you a real hold on why it fails to be metric. Uh, Heath, who was a student of Jones's once upon a time, had a series of papers about 1964, which gave several topological characterizations of having to the LF naught uh, depending upon which way this went, he had topological equivalences, and one of them uh, had direct bearing on this problem. He proved that there's a separable normal Moore space which is not metric if and only if there is a subset X of the reals, an uncountable subset, <coughs> such that if you take any subset Y of X, then y is a relative f sigma, relative to x. So this was a necessary and sufficient condition. It gave a beautiful translation for the uh, set theorists to get a hold of. Bing had another translation of the more general problem, which appeared in 1967. And at about that time, we had a student at Wisconsin in Madison whose name is Frank Tall who, in the very much the same spirit of Tannenbaum, was absolutely determined, in spite of uh, lots of discouragement from Bing and me, to attack this problem. And he bent the ear of a young visiting logician named Jack Silver, until Silver solved the problem before he did, by least two <laughs> <laughs> What Silver showed was there was a model of set theory in which uh, there uh, was a separable, normal, non-metrizable Moore space. <coughs> of course, this does not settle the general problem. Someone may yet give an example of a normal Moore space which is not metric, uh, which doesn't in any way depend upon a model of set theory. However, Tall has shown that the cardinality has to be quite large if there is one, and so 
uh, the direct interest in the problem in a way is dimmed. Let me uh, steal a, uh, an illustration of talls. I'm going to describe to you what happens in a couple of very specific models of set theory. For those of you who care, model A has the generalized continuum hypothesis and LF2 coin extension of omega 1, and model B is Martin's axiom and the negation of the continuum hypothesis. In model A, there every separable normal Mohr space is metric. In model B, I mean in model A, there, there exists a Suslin line, however. In model B, there exists a normal, non-metrizable Mohr space, but there is no Suslin line. Um, these models, in a way, illustrate how these uh, facts are carried along to all sorts of other problems which people look at. For instance, it's been known, Karepa proved a million years ago, that if you take the square of a Suslin line, it does not have the countable chain condition, although the Suslin line has the countable chain condition. Kunin has shown that in this model of set theory, the countable chain condition is preserved by arbitrary properties. So uh, this is a much more general fact, in a way, than this very specific little thing about the Suslin line. Um, there's an old question um, by Ponomorov about whether there was, if you had a compact, there exists a compact, perfectly separable, uh, non metrized non compact, perfectly normal. You know what perfectly normal is? Every closed set to G delta, um, which is not separable. Now then, a Susla line, if you just chop it off, has that property. But it sounds like there might very well exist one without there being a Suslin line. On the other hand, in this model of set theory, every compact, perfectly normal space is separable. So that uh, this means that that's not the place where you're going to close down a nice theorem. You again have the problem unsettled. The same sorts of things happen with the normal more space problem. Um, a long time ago, it was proved that if you have a metacompact separable, if you have, I won't even tell you what that means, but uh, suppose you have that and separability. <laughs> then the, every normal Mohr space with those two properties is metric. On the other hand, and so it had been hoped that if you had a metacompact normal Mohr space, it would be metric without separability. That is, it was hoped that that would be a theorem. However, there exists a model here of a metacompact uh, normal non-metrizable Mohr space, one that's completely different from that one because anything that has both these properties is, uh, me uh, is metric. Now then, there's another old problem. This is a problem of Alexandrov's again. It's as well known in Russia uh, as the problem of the existence of a normal non-metrizable Mohr space is here. Uh, Every list of problems always has that problem on the list. And the problem is, does there exist a normal, non-metrizable space, which is the continuous image of a metric space under a compact open map? And the, it is equivalent to this metacompact normal Mohr space thing. And so it falls. There exists a, an example in this model of such a space. So that it is solved there, and uh, the, uh, the uh, negation is true over here. So that that problem uh, fell with the same examples. So that these problems carry with them all sorts of other things which weren't exactly proved equivalent, but uh, are related in one way or another. Okay, so much for tall uh, example. There is a problem which Alexandrov asked about in a paper which was a joint paper with Eurozone in 1923. 
He asked, does there exist a first countable, <coughs> compact, um, let's see, what else do we need? Uh, house star space with cardinality greater than C. A. V. Arkengelski, who is unquestionably the world's leading general topologist of the moment, uh, proved that any space having these properties has cardinality less than or equal to C. This is a beautiful theorem. <laughs> it's a real theorem. And it's a, a pretty theorem in an area where pretty theorems are very scarce. It did not have a consistency result uh, answer as had been hoped or thought or conjectured. It had a perfectly simple, straightforward answer which might have been given in 1920. On the other hand, I don't think it would have been given in 1920. The, uh, the techniques are just a little more sophisticated than the techniques that they used at that time. Let me tell you how he proves the theorem. I think it's a very pretty theorem. Uh, the, he uses the idea of a free sequence. If you have a well-ordered sequence and you take a Dedekind cut in it, the sequence is called free if the closure of each halves of the cut are disjoint. It's easy to prove that a space that has these properties does not admit an uncountable free sequence. Now, from there, uh, one uh, should start to construct a free sequence. And you would expect to do it just by, you know, you uh, go along and construct an uncountable free sequence. But that, doesn't, that technique simply doesn't work. That technique would have been used in 1920. The technique that works is to construct a huge tree of maximal um, free sequences and prove that the tree is so large that one of the sequences in the tree has to be uncountable. Very simple, straightforward kind of an idea, except just it wasn't a technique that would have been tried. And um, the solution of this problem has led to the solution of a large number of other counting problems. It has uh, made general topologists willing to look at all the old counting problems. And they're counting everything in sight. It sort of upsets me. <laughs> but uh, they, uh, they're really getting some answers to a lot of these old problems by using their somewhat more sophisticated techniques. I had a letter from Yuhash on Wednesday saying that he can now construct a space which is uh, uh, totally disconnected. Uh, hereditarily separable and house door, which has cardinality greater than C. Well, it has cardinality to the C. Not greater than C. So that uh, we're closing down on exactly what cardinalities have to be. I mean, you know, this is possible, that's not, they're very close together. This is, again, a non-consistency result. The last problem I want to discuss, I call Dauffer's problem. However, it really ought to be called uh, Borsuk's problem. Borsuk is the man who made it an interesting problem because uh, Marshall had the idea of a space being normal and of uh, having its Cartesian product with a unit interval be normal. Uh, something that satisfies both of these conditions is called binormal. 
And Barsic proved that if you have a, what's called a homotopy extension theorem, that is, if you have a space which is binaural that has both of these properties, that you can extend homotopies on closed sets. But he didn't know whether the, uh, whether he was saying when he said binormal more than normal. And um, so it became a quite interesting problem. Lots of the theorems in homotopy theory have binormality as a part of their hypothesis. And you never knew whether you were assuming too much or not. Um, the thing that Dauker did was not until 1947, and actually um, uh, Kachetov proved exactly the same theorems at just about the same time, completely independently. He showed that if you have a normal space, it's binormal if and only if it's countably paracompact. And it's binormal if and only if it satisfies Hahn's theorem. And it's binormal if and only if it satisfies um, a, a sequence of uh, sort of messy conditions. But those messy conditions are sort of a formula for constructing such a space. And so finding a space that's not binormal, a normal space that's not binormal, became known as looking for a Dauker space. Such spaces became known as Dauker spaces. Um, in 1953, I proved that if there was a Suslin line, then there was a Doppler space. And uh, some years later, when someone asked me about this, after the Suslin thing had been settled, um, I noticed that it didn't, the proof I had did not in any way depend on having a Suslin line, that is, a Suslin tree of cardinality LF1. It would do just as well to have a Suslin tree of cardinality LF2 or LF3 or LF4. That what I needed was a Suslin tree of uh, one of these peculiar cardinalities, which uh, were difficult to work with. But it never occurred to me to look at the fact that there are trivial Suslin trees for some cardinals until uh, someone else pointed out to me that this <laughs> might be relevant. and. I looked at it, and after pushing and pulling for quite a while, I used the trivial little fan that I showed you a while ago to construct uh, a Doppler space, construct a space with this property. I think it really opens up many more problems than it settles. That is, I think there is a direct connection between the existence of Doppler spaces of certain kinds, and I don't know what the right kind is. I don't know what the theorem is. Uh, that is, how do you, it isn't the cardinality of the space uh, quite, <laughs> but there's an equivalence relation of some kind, I think, between Suslin spaces and Doppler spaces. And I'm not sure quite what uh, the theorem should be, much less what the answer is. But um, these problems are now under attack also. I um, should, uh, say that what all of this says to me is that it's uh, beautiful that uh, general topology is now taking advantage of some of the beautiful techniques of set theory. I talk much faster than I think I do, so I have a little time mm -hmm. left. I think I'll tell you about a problem. <laughs> since I have such a large, captive audience. <laughs> this is what I've been working on for the last six months or so. Suppose you take a family of spaces, let's say just a countable number, x1, x2, x3, and take um, the product, the xn's, and topologize this space, not in the usual way, but topologize it by taking boxes. That is, take an open set from each one of your spaces and uh, look at the product of the open sets. And have the product of open sets be open. Now, if one defines this topology, it's called the box product of your spaces, uh, 
the reason for not, I mean, it looks much more natural to me in a way than the usual uh, definition of product. The unfortunate fact is that it makes a topological space that's horrid. It, uh, for instance, suppose your spaces are lines. Let's suppose they're closed unit intervals, shall we? If you take the box product of a countable number of closed unit intervals, the space that you get is totally disconnected, it's not compact, it's uh, not first countable, it's, uh, think of something else bad, and it's surely that. <laughs> um, on the other hand, deciding whether the space is normal or paracompact is impossible. That is, it's difficult. <laughs> it isn't obvious. Uh, the number of false proofs that this is normal or paracompact, as the case may be, uh, in the literature is uh, you know, larger than five, to my certain knowledge. Uh, there are lots of false proofs of this. Um, I can prove that such a product of uh, lines, for instance, uh, let's see, if you want nice spaces, I think it's sigma compact uh, metric spaces, uh, is paracompact if one assumes the continuum hypothesis. But if you don't assume the continuum hypothesis, I haven't any idea how it would work. For instance, if you just take ordinals, take omega naught plus one, a simple limit point of a countable sequence. Suppose each one of your spaces was a copy of omega naught plus one. I can't prove that's normal. Never mind paracompact, if I don't assume the continuum hypothesis. This seems like a very simple set theoretic idea, and uh, I um, don't know the answer to it. There is one case uh, for, I can prove that the box product of uh, ordinals that are co-final with omega, or ordinals that uh, are sigma compact, the union of a countable number of compact ordinals, that that product, using the continuum hypothesis, uh, is uh, paracompact. But I don't have any idea about um, without the continuum hypothesis, <coughs> even for this very simple case. There is one case that seems very different. And this is the case where you have one ordinal, which is uncountable, say omega 1, and a countable number of other ordinals of cardinality, well, this is omega naught plus 1. Nice little compact pieces. This box product, not even with the continuum hypothesis, can I touch it? I don't have any idea whether this product is. Uh, um, normal or not. It can't be paracompact. Why can't it be paracompact? No, this isn't paracompact. So uh, it has one uh, of its coordinates is not paracompact. So you can't hope to get paracompact in this, in this case. But you should be able to get normality. But I don't know how to prove it for um, this special case. The special case that this is, is a case in which you have the successor of something co-final with omega. All other cases I can handle with the continuum hypothesis. But without the continuum hypothesis, I can't do anything. So, this is this space, incidentally, is only, so far as topologists are concerned, is only an example machine. Frequently, topologists want to know about spaces that are that have properties like paracompactness and normality, which are bad in other ways. This has all other bad properties, but it has those properties nicely, perhaps. And if one knew that it was nice, it would be nice to use. <laughs> And I use such a space to construct the, I use this topology on that fan 
to construct it out for space. That's where my interest in it came from. I think there are lots of other problems in which this would be very applicable if we knew how to handle it. Okay, thank you very much.